matter where you are in the world, there's always time for a great song. This is Life with Rob McGowan. Celebrates the stories that lift us up through the music we love. Come along for the ride. Weekdays from 1 till 3 on Life Radio, the positive voice. Now, here's Rob McGowan. Hi, this is Rob McGowan with Life Radio, and we're here with Marina Hoffman. Uh, who's a young lady who's doing great works. Uh, it's something special that we're going to talk about today, uh, women in the Bible, which is a, a different approach. You know, you see always, always the same angle, same story, same approach. And uh, I thought your idea and your background, uh, you've got a PhD, you're award-winning, uh, school known for fresh insight, engaging style, it says here on your site. Marina teaches at Palm Beach Atlantic University and was published in public studies, theology, psychology, trauma, education, ministry, ethics. Uh, she has an inspiring, joyful spirit. And as a survivor of a life-threatening trauma, uh, Marina is passionate about uh, sharing the incredible testimony of God's redemption and uh, healing and hope and everything in Christ. When I read that, I was like, first thing that came to me is trauma. Wait a minute. So then I had to go read your story. And I was like, wow, that really sort of got me... Uh, a little bit like teared up almost. I was thinking that's what an awful thing for somebody to have to go through. And, uh, and I, when I look, you see you, you're beautiful, you look young and you would never think you just think, Oh yeah, top of the world, everything's fine. But people don't realize what people go through and how they get to the dispositions or positions in their life. So it says in 2014, you and your husband were in a head on collision, uh, just North of Toronto, Ontario. And the impact was uh, around 125 miles per hour. Uh, you incurred lacerations to your bowel, uh, nearly dead by the time you reached the hospital, but God pre preserved your life at the crash site. Within seconds, I was uh, surrounded by emergency workers, prevented me from uh, moving and saving my life. And, uh, and it says a lady put her hands in, didn't even bother to do a, she just checked you out by looking at the injuries himself and decided right then and there just to go ahead and they started working on you. That must have, that, that lady was pretty incredible. Yeah, she saved my life. She was older. She told me this after she said, you're really lucky you had an older surgeon. She said it was my day off, but I was in the cafeteria, which I think itself is amazing. Who would choose hospital cafeteria food on a Sunday <laughs> afternoon unless they had to. And she said, I learned way back in school, the long way of how to fix someone up. You open up their whole torso, take out all their organs, one by one, feel for holes and then stitch them back up. So today they have dye tests and all this microscopic surgery, but she said they, there was no time. So she did it old fashioned. I don't even like to picture all my wow. organs out and then back in. I know, but I, just the fact that she was able to do that, you just happen to be in the right place at the right time with this incredible. Now there was an, another, I guess the man who hit you, uh, he died in the accident. Yes, he died within minutes. And did your husband end up with any serious injuries or anything? Or? He did. So mine, apart from the lacerations, which were fixed that day, mine were more psychological because I had a brain injury. So I had a long way to go mentally and emotionally, psychologically. Larry was okay, but right as the car had hit us, and for him, everything slowed down. But he felt literally the brakes break off and fall and he felt that no longer he had any control in the steering wheel so in that very split second he threw his body onto the passenger side to hopefully save my life he thought he didn't have a chance and in a sense he was right because that other car pushed our jeep engine into the driver's seat but the only way he survived no one knew how he was around the detective came by and said how are you alive the computer won't tell me but he had thrown his body over and his first injury was a rib. His own, he broke his own rib trying to save my life. But wow. because the engine was where he was supposed to be, it ended up saving his life. Even his knees were fine because he, he pushed them away. But his hip was sticking out. His one ankle was crushed. His other ankle was broken. He broke eight ribs. So he has a lot of titanium in his body. That's incredible. What a... <laughs> What a story to tell. Holy cow. Yeah, it's incredible. But if you saw him, you would not know it because he doesn't even walk with a limp. Really? Isn't it? So is, is he a, a believer in God too and follows uh, the Bible or is it 
Yes, really strong. We both have been Christians for a very long time and our faith was such a strong function for us to continue to go on. I remember I was in the hospital in those must have been the first day or second and I couldn't hold on mentally to the thought that Larry was alive. I thought he might be dead and I'm sure people told me I felt that I was utterly alone for hours and my family told me after they never left my side and yet in that moment a feeling feeling completely alone that my life was over and my husband had died. I just remember Christ's presence was so strong in the room and just the knowledge that in my weakness, Christ will be my strength. And I really needed that message in that moment. Wow. That's when you were talking about the story about the nurses being around in the room. So did you know what was going on when they were all surrounding you in there? No, I don't have any memories. I actually have severe amnesia, so I don't remember hardly anything of my life, but all, everything I remember of the accident is completely wrong because I thought I had been abandoned for days in the hospital by myself. Oh, really? So severe amnesia. So how does, how does that work? Like, is it like a, you remember only so far back? Is it a short-term amnesia or is it you forget the long-term parts of your life or how does that work? Well, for me, it's, my memories, as it were, of my own history are much like my husband's. So he told me stories of growing up. So I know facts of his life, but I don't know how he felt. I have no emotional connection to his history. And that's really how I feel about myself. I knew I was married. I knew I had two sisters. I knew my name, but I don't feel any real connection to my own history, even though if I don't want to disclose all this information, I can pretty much fake it with someone. But really, it's just facts I know about my life rather than all the emotion that goes with Christmas memories, birthday memories, trips. Wow. And wow, that's interesting. But it's really okay, Rob, because yeah. the other really positive side is my, all of my memories are pretty much with my husband. So I feel like I get the pleasure of being in a situation where I feel like I've been married for 60 years because my whole life in my mind has been with my husband and it's actually really special and I think also I really appreciate every single moment because I want to remember everything going forward. Yeah, so I love celebrating probably more than before the accident. Wow, that's something else. I, first time I've met somebody, you know, you see in the movies, amnesia, and you think, yeah, how does that work? But uh, it's the first time I've met somebody who actually was going through it. And uh, so your family, do you, you recognize all your family when they come over? Do you have family, lots of family? Though? Yeah. Two, two younger sisters, a mom and dad, and my husband has a huge family. So I know them all well. I just need them to remind me sometimes of the things we've done. But the accident is seven years ago now, so I don't really think about it. I guess it's what you don't know won't hurt you, right? So um, oh. what I don't remember doesn't matter. And I have so many memories. I have a little girl now. She's three. So we have a busy life. So your memories now, do you keep them as you go forward? Yes. And I take lots of pictures and those pictures bring back all the emotions with it. But my memory has come so far. It's very much a blessing. I'm so thankful, God. Every day, I think my memory gets a little bit better. That's awesome. So when you're writing in school and thesis and you're learning about God and you come up with this idea, you know, a perspective from women's perspective on the Bible, what, what got you thinking about that? Or how did you decide, I want, I want to tell the story in this way? Well, at first it was an academic endeavor. I didn't see a lot of commentary on women and I wanted more and deeper and more profound insights. So I thought, well, let me try this myself. And it went well, but then I have to say after my accident in the weeks to come, when I started to go back to the Bible and reread these stories, it meant so much more to me. And instead of thinking about them from a distance, I really connected with their stories. And to my amazement, I felt that the challenges they faced in so many ways were the same challenges I was facing. Um, it took a while, but as the years went by, I kept sharing this, these stories all the time and eventually thought, you know what, why don't I put this in a book so I can share it with others? Because I think a lot of women will relate to their stories. So how, is, how many books do you have now? Is it just the one or do you have more? Yeah, just the one for a popular audience. I wouldn't okay. recommend my academic work because it's a little bit drier, <laughs> Rob. I like that stuff though, <laughs> but the book sounds interesting and it's in bookstores right across the country. And uh, so people are able to get it. So tell people the name of your book. 
Yeah, it's Women in the Bible, small group Bible study. And as you said, it's in bookstores. I'm thankful to Lighthouse Bookstore in Fredericton and R.D. McLean in Moncton for holding it, for carrying it. But if you can't get it there, it's also on Amazon, Women in the Bible, small group Bible study. That's awesome. And we're hoping uh, some of these stores will play this interview when it airs in a couple of days on, in their stores and uh, go out and get the book. It's amazing uh, read and all the stuff she's talking about. So give me a, an example of maybe your favorite sort of you're reading it and thinking, wow, a new perspective and, and how you would put it to somebody from. Well, I love the stories of the midwives and some of your listeners may not be too familiar with them. It's a short story but it's situated in the time of the Exodus, right before the Exodus. So here the Hebrews are working under slavery in Egypt. And of all things, God is blessing them and they're multiplying greatly. But Pharaoh's getting nervous because there's too many foreigners in his land. So he calls the midwives and says, if it's a boy that's born, I want you to kill him. Well, this is crazy. The midwives whole life and career is about bringing life And now they're asked to kill baby boys and they find a really creative way to defy the Pharaoh. And even from a literary perspective, make fun of him and accomplish something great because all the boys are saved and the Pharaoh is left really unsure of what's going on. Wow. So what, when you say from a literary perspective, explain that a little bit more. Well, you know, On the outside, it's simple. They just don't kill the boys, but they find a way of lying to the Pharaoh and they tell the Pharaoh when he summons them and he says, how come you're not killing the boys? He tells them that the Hebrew women are much different than the Egyptian women. They give birth so fast. They're so strong. The babies are born and they're gone before the midwives even get there. But we can figure out that there's two problems with that. If that's true, why did the midwives even have a profession? So clearly it can't be true. The other A fact that every mother and father will know is that giving birth is not about a racial or ethnic issue. The experience of giving birth is one of the beautiful experiences that all women share on earth. So the Pharaoh doesn't ask questions. He seems to accept it, but how foolish that he thinks that Hebrew women give birth in different ways than Egyptians. (laughs) I, but that's again, the first you know, time I heard about that. That's because, really interesting. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, and I think it's clever because the midwives, they must know that the pharaoh, maybe as a man or maybe as a king either, will be embarrassed to ask all kinds of questions about the birthing process, right? Not so different than today. Some people just don't even want to think about it. Um, so it's a clever ploy they use to silence him and yet continue to bring life and fulfill their calling. That's awesome. <laughs> See, this is why you got to read the book. It's got all kinds of good stuff in there. So you yeah, uh, story. you get going along. And so you must have found quite a few stories like this, sort of hidden gems in between the lines as you're looking from this perspective. And uh, does it follow a pattern or is there a certain thing you found like in every story, there's one of these sort of hidden gems about women and what they were doing behind the scenes? I would say the beauty is that they each face unique situations, but in terms of generalities, Absolutely. They all face some kind of challenge or obstacle that they need to overcome. And then we find out, do they use their own methods like the midwives, or we can say God is leading them and prompting them in ways, or sometimes they're just in such a hard situation that they have to rely on God continually and completely. I think of Hannah, she wants to have a child, but that's not something she can make happen, even though she's tried for years. So in her situation, she's so desperate. And I think what we take from her is that she trusts God and beautifully, God does work a miracle in her life. Wow. That's something else. Well, see, when I, when I seen women in the Bible, first thing I thought of was, you know, Mary, of course, and Mary Magdalene, I was thinking, you know, I never think of everybody else in the Bible, but those, uh, they, women, I've always been on this sort of discussion back and forth of, uh, you know, men have dominated the world kind of thing, but I don't know that that's necessarily true. I think women have sort of eased things along and made everything possible. And uh, yeah, there's so many stories, but I think maybe Rob, we don't talk about them as much. And again, maybe that comes back to the fact that there's not as much scholarship on the female characters, but you take even the most famous female, Mary, right? Mother of Jesus. Look at the impact she made on Christ bringing Jesus into the world there from his first moment. 
And she takes her call so seriously. We see her showing up all throughout, all throughout the Gospels and into Acts. She prompts Jesus at his very first miracle, launching his ministry. She's with them at the death. She's a witness to the resurrection. And then surely when Jesus ascends, her job is done, right? No, we find her after Christ is gone with the apostles waiting for the Holy Spirit. So what an incredible influence on Jesus. And also one of the people that launched the early church. I think her role is incredible. And yet maybe it's not a story we hear often. Wow. This is, I see all kinds of movies from this now. <laughs> I'm a visual guy. So I, I love to watch the, you know, the movies and the ways they describe the Bible. And, uh, and when you're reading it, I always picture in my mind, I'm, I'm a little older. So I picture the older actors doing this out, but I'm thinking that uh, these stories need to be told more, more emphasis on the women in the Bible, especially in today's day and age with uh, all the talk about men and women and how it's a discussion we need to have together that we're all part of it together and how important women are even way back throughout the Bible and through history. God has always thought of us as, you know, equal where there's no one above the other. And uh, these stories are important to show how important women were. Yeah. And you think even today, I think everyone who's a mom and maybe especially those who are a stay at home mom who have had to homeschool this last year and a half, who have had to do everything and felt overwhelmed and miraculously some of them stayed in a career. I think it's so applaudable what they've done. And I hope that every single woman who's done that and um, husband who's watched their wife just take over and succeed at everything this last year and a half. I hope they realize the impact they've made and that it's not just in the day-to-day -day and taking care of the basic needs, but through those basic day-to-day -day features, they're forming the lives of their children. And this is beyond the scope of my book, but I also look at Hannah and her son, Samuel. And I think most people will know about Samuel. Samuel's story covers many chapters. But when we examine his life and we say, what are five or six key features? They are all reflected in Hannah. Hannah was a woman of prayer. Samuel brought everything to the Lord in prayer. You know, Hannah had this conflict with the priest and the authority. Samuel finds himself in the same place. One thing after another. Another fact, uh, Hannah gives this beautiful prophecy in, in 1 Samuel. Again, Samuel is known as a prophet. So even though Hannah's story is so much shorter, she sets the tone for Samuel and really the tone for all of Israel. And if Israel had looked at Hannah's example and had prayed and had committed their ways to God and has trusted God more, maybe history would have been different for them. Wow. Yeah, that's incredible. I, uh, I belong to this group on Wednesday nights. I'm, I'm, like everybody, I'm seeking God and, and trying to find an understanding of what God is to me and, and find my way in the world, in God's world. And I've been talking to this woman in Poland. And, uh, well, the backstory is I, I sort of, I, I've been doing this DMN meeting. It's like discipleship meeting where we talk to people around the world and how, you know, it's like a butterfly effect. If I talk to you about God and you talk to somebody about God and the Jesus teaching was it was supposed to go four generations down and uh so in these meetings i'm always saying i you know i'm not a preacher guy i'm not baptizing people in, and that's not my thing but uh i talked to this woman and she was couldn't hardly speak english and she but her husband had died just when covid started but when he died she didn't know what he died of they covid nobody knew what covid was then so this was happening and then people in her community all of a sudden all these wives were losing their husbands and and she didn't know how to help or what was going on. She'd spent hours in her room crying and crying. And uh, she was saying, God, I, I need to help. I need help. Help me. And, and her children would hug her. And, but she didn't even know how to talk to her children. So about six months goes by and she starts to finally come back around. And she, she's still praying to God every day, just in deep prayer. And then she realizes this light comes in and she says, well, I know a lawyer. I'm going to help other women who are going through this. So, so she gets this lawyer on her team and she gets a therapist on her team and she starts looking up every writing about everything going on. And she creates this group for widows helping their husbands. And I thought, mm -hmm. what a powerful, and she, her husband had been a minister, but she said, I was never really a good girl growing up. I was kind of a bad and, and I'm not the kind of person God would use. And I was telling her that uh, in, in our discipleship meetings, we were talking about Jesus going to the well 
and he didn't pick a, you know, a perfect person at the well to go to get the message started. He picked this woman who had had four husbands and was known in the town as not the best of things, but that's who he chose to open up to and, and teach God to and spread his message. I said, we don't know who God, God knows our heart. And it, and it's, and that's the most relevant thing. And what she's doing is incredible. It just blew my mind and brought me to tears. And I thought, wow, here's some powerful woman doing this story. And it's just insane. And here's, you are talking about women and who knows, maybe in the future, she's one of these women. It's incredible. That's an incredible story. And I think her life really reflects the path that so many women in the Bible took where they're living their life normal day to day and all of a sudden a challenge comes but by the end of the story they've overcome that challenge with God's help in ways that you know maybe we can say I could never ask or imagine she probably never imagined the impact that she could make before her husband died so what a beautiful story yeah and I don't think when she was praying that's what she was thinking would be the answers to her prayers right sometimes we don't know what God's answers are it's incredible and who knew yeah, that's that great testimony too just that the place I am now, I could never have imagined, but it challenges me every day to ask God for as much of God's presence and calling as we feel comfortable. And just to know that God can actually do more than we can imagine. And it challenges me also to stop and look back and remember where I came from. You know, um, Rob, after the accident happened, it was two whole months. It was eight weeks until I could say the word yes or no without stuttering. And I could get it out in a second instead of 10 seconds. Wow. And now it's just the fact that I can talk without stuttering is literally more than I could have ever imagined. But again, it's just God working in our lives day by day, doing something amazing. So when you're seeking God and, and trying to find, you know, what God means to you in, in your life, how do you communicate with God in prayer or listen to God or, or think this is a good thing to do and, and story and spread your message and God's message? What sort of I'm always trying to understand how we all communicate with God and figure out the I, I sort of have a not a trick I do, but I as I, I want to make sure I'm not telling myself the answers all the time that I want to hear. So I'll sort of wait for confirmation. I'll, I'll say a prayer to God and then I'll wait to hear from somebody else to talk about that thing that I'm praying about. And then I say, okay, I got my confirmation that I'm going down the right path type of thing. So that's my way of sort of understanding or speaking with God. Do you have something like yeah. that in your life? And or? there's a lot of people in the Bible who ask for signs and God gives them it. So I think there's a lot of biblical background for what you're saying. Um, for me, the practice I like the most is in the morning after we're done our coffee, my husband, little three-year-old and I, we pray together in any order, but it's just an opportunity for us to share what's on our heart, to pray for one another. And I think out of that, our conversation after we've each prayed for a few minutes, that to me really speaks to me. I find my husband will just be led by the Lord to say something encouraging, or maybe the Lord speaks to me, but just always taking that time, which is maybe only five or six minutes um, to include my little daughter in it. Sometimes as she prays, if you can believe it or not, Rob, she's been praying since she was one. And sometimes when she prays, it's like the Lord speaks to me and I see a glimpse into her heart and God is able to direct me on what I can do that day to bless her and impact her. Cause now I have a little insight into what's on her mind as she prays. So that's my thing, a little bit different than yours, that's but awesome. maybe the theme of, of signs is still there, even in a different way. That's incredible. I like that idea. Listening to, uh, yeah, that's incredible. So your, your husband, is he, did you guys meet somehow in, in church or something? Or how did you, you both seem to be in the faith quite a bit. One didn't come yeah, after the was, other. He was the vice president at Tyndale and I was working there in his department, but I didn't even realize uh, really how the hierarchy worked. So, but our paths crossed a bunch of times and I really respected him and thought he was a person that would bless me if he was in my life every day for the rest of my life. So I tried to persuade him to email, to marry me, but Rob, it took five years. <laughs> Um, and then he finally agreed, I will say, I'm able to humbly admit that I asked him to marry me almost every weekend for five years. Wow. <laughs> That's <laughs> something. So you're persistent, if, if anything. <laughs> yes, persistent. So your book, how long has it been out now? It came out in, I think, February, but we had a lot of issues with Amazon. They wouldn't list it. 
So when they finally listed it in May, that's when I launched, you know, launched the book, told everyone about it and sent you an email around. to see yeah. if we could talk about it. So I'm so thankful for all the support I had, including you. Oh, that's incredible. Oh no, this, this story is great. I think it's uh, women in the Bible and women in general need to, to have a voice that uh, needs to get out there. So, cause there's so many powerful, amazing stories that we can gather and get closer to God from that kind of stuff. So I think it's, it's what you're doing is great. And uh, I haven't, I haven't read the book yet. I haven't even ordered the book yet. Cause we just met last week there. And I, uh, but I, I am ordering the book off of Amazon because I want to oh, read it thank you. and uh, be able to talk about it. And I'll, I'll put the, the link up on our website. So people will be able to go and find it once I, uh, well, actually you can send me the link to the, the page and then I'll just post that on our page and our Facebook and get that spread sure, out and for also people. there's a free video series on the website it corresponds with all the chapters there's nothing at all that your listeners need to do they can they don't need to give their email address it's just their uh, video for each chapter and if the book encourages them to think theologically and to learn a lot the videos are a lot more personal and i share how i really have connected with each story so well, that's awesome i didn't even may like the free series too so maybe we could put that up on our website as well and people can go and read those and see them and be connected. Sure, Thank you. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Oh, so is there anything, uh, so what's your goal at the end of this for the books and the stories and what you're trying to you accomplish? Know, I really want women of faith to be encouraged and it's everything you're saying, Rob, they do have a voice. They have a huge influence on everyone around them. Fundamental influence really as mothers, as wives, our ministry is 24 seven to the people around us as friends. And I hope that when they read the book, they feel empowered in God. And no matter how weak they might feel, I think a lot of us struggle with confidence and we doubt ourselves. We think maybe we're not making a difference or God won't call me. But even in that state, God will do something amazing because the New Testament tells us when we are weak, we are strongest because in our weakness, we rely on God and God does something incredible beyond what we could have done if we had just gone in our own strength. So I love that idea. And I think of it all the time. If I have any kind of strength or not, my greatest strength is actually not as a human, but as one as follower of Christ and depending on him. So I just want to uplift your audience. And for the men out there who really want to support women, whether it be their wives, their daughters, their friends, people in their church. What a great way to start that path, to learn about the women in the Bible and realize they made a huge difference and women of faith can make a similar large difference today. That's incredible. I, I could talk about this forever. Maybe we'll uh, continue on and down the road, we'll do a, a show once a month or something where we talk about, you come on and tell me your stories about something you're studying, the women in the Bible and enlighten me and us and our whole audience because I think it'd be great thank you Rob I would love it that'd be awesome well I'm gonna post it up and uh we'll talk about uh where you can get Marina's book and what were the two bookstores in New Brunswick you said you could get it at Lighthouse Bookstore in Fredericton and Artie McLean in Moncton awesome so I don't even have to go to Amazon I can go right local and shop and pick it up yes that'd Perfect. be great <laughs> well thank you again for coming on and uh sharing your story. It's an incredible journey. And I want to thank you. Thank you. And all the best to all your listeners. <laughs> Thanks, Marina. You have a great day. Like a bird on a tree. I'm just sitting here. I got time. Clear to see from up here, the world seems small. We can sit too.